Hey guys, welcome back. Well, I thought we'd focus a little bit today on a topic we don't usually talk about. Usually it's about guide scopes versus off-axis guiders, telescopes, long focal length, short focal length, mounts, PhD2 algorithms, and so on. Well, today I want to talk about everything that's below that, the tripod. And a couple of questions that come up when we look at some of the offerings from some of the manufacturers that we go to. Do we want to upgrade to a stiffer tripod? Now, Celestron, for example, and I'm showing their products here, Celestron has the normal tripod, which is what I have for my C-Gem and my C925. I bought that as a package some time ago. But if you buy a C11 or C14, you get the upgraded tripod, which has two and three quarter inch diameter legs versus the two inch diameter steel legs that I have. The steel legs on the upgraded platform are thicker and overall that tripod is about twice as heavy as the tripod I have. Does that matter or doesn't it? Also, we're also concerned about vibration and Celestron in this case also has these vibration suppression pads that you can put under each foot of the tripod to dampen out vibrations as might result from, for example, a gust of wind or somebody walking uh, next to the telescope causing the ground to shake a little bit. Now, this, is this a good idea? Should we be thinking about these two things? And these are the issues I want to tackle in today's presentation. I'm going to take an engineering approach to the definition of strength, stability, and stiffness. I know we talk generally fairly loosely about these terms. And the first one is strength. Strength refers to, from an engineering perspective, into how much stress can a given material take. Now in the case of steel, steel has a yield stress. That's the the stress that when you expose the material to that level of stress, it can no longer handle any extra applied loads. It doesn't break. It doesn't fracture. It just bends and deforms more easily after you reach that yield stress. In the case of the tripod legs that I have on my standard Celestron tripod, it's a stainless steel. It's two inches in diameter, and I think it's about 0.049 inch thick material. So you have something that looks like this picture here. And what we're concerned about is the axial force going down through the tri tripod leg. Uh, which comes out to be about 40 pounds when you take the, the weight of everything above, the mount, the imaging rig, the counterweights, etc., and take into account the fact that the legs are at an angle. It comes out to a fairly heavy load for, say, a C11 type imaging system of around 40 pounds per leg going down the axis there. Take that 40 pounds and divide it by the area of steel that you have here, and that comes out to a stress of 130 psi. But for a low-end version of steel, you could get 30,000 PSI easily out of steel, which means from a strength perspective, the legs are 218 times stronger than they have to be to support even the heaviest of the imaging loads that we might consider. So strength is definitely not an issue. And by the way, the building that you live in, the building that you work in, the bridge you drive over to get from point A to point B, those kinds of structures are designed to have a factor of safety of about two. The next issue is stability. Normally when people talk conversationally about stability, I think what they're really talking about is vibration. We'll talk about vibration in the next slide. This is the engineering definition of stability, uh, which has to do with buckling of a structure. And if you want to think of a simple example to illustrate buckling, think of an uncooked piece of spaghetti held between uh, two forefingers, and then you try to compress that piece of spaghetti very slowly, and it will bow out. Even though you're trying to press along the axis of the strand of spaghetti, it bends and, and deforms outward. What that is, is buckling. It can't handle any more load because it's too slender, and it can't handle the axial force that you're applying to it. Well, I use some of the software that I use at work to create a simple model of a tripod and a telescope. You can see it here in line format. And then did a buckling analysis of this arrangement here and found out the buckling load for a given leg of a standard Celestron tripod is about 14,000 pounds. And again, I've got a force in each leg of about 40 pounds. So that's a factor of safety of 357. So we're not worried about the strength. We're not worried about the stability. So what we want to do really from here on in is focus on stiffness and the factors that affect vibration, which for us, vibration translates into pointing error. If the telescope tilts left and right, forward and aft, that means our imaging sensor is tilting left and right, forward and aft. Uh, that allows light to be spread across multiple pixels on our imaging sensor, which is exactly what we're trying to avoid. This equation I'm showing here, don't worry, we're not going to get too deep into the math here, but this 
uh, equation is about the simplest equation uh, that you can have to describe vibration. And those of you who've been through a physics or engineering curriculum uh, have probably seen this uh, possibly in your in your sophomore year in a differential equations course. It's just a, a differential equation with constant coefficients, second order. And uh, for us, it, it serves as a useful vehicle to talk about the various factors that affect how our system, our telescope imaging system, behaves. On the right-hand side is an F, which varies with time, a function of time. This is a force that could come from a wind gust, for example, or from uh, some ground vibration set up by somebody walking too close to the telescope. The X in here is the response of the system. It could be displacement, like the, the imaging sensor or the telescope moves to the left, the right, or toward the target. We don't care about that. What we care about is tilt. We care about the, the telescope tilting in the fore-aft direction or the right-left direction because that translates into a screwed up image on our part. So this displacement, instead of thinking of it as a translation, think of it as an angle of rotation. And then the x dot is a velocity, and the x double dot is an acceleration. And then we have these other constants in here that relate to our telescope system. For example, the mass is everything that's sitting on top of the tripod. It's the OTA, the camera, the mount, the counterweights, everything that's sitting on the tripod is the mass in this system. The stiffness is our tripod. It's the uh, axial stiffness of these stainless steel legs of the tripod. And then in the middle here, we have a damping coefficient. Now this, ideally, we would like to have the stiffness of a system be very high. We would like for a damping coefficient to be very high, and we would like for the mass to be very low. But of course, we're kind of stuck with what the mass is just based on what we're trying to do. If we want a C14, well, they don't make a lightweight C14. It's You can buy a carbon fiber uh, version of a, of a telescope, and that might cut down some of the mass. But uh, by and large, we're stuck with the mass we have. And we can, however, make the stiffness parameter here larger by upgrading the tripod, if that's worth it. It's part of the question we want to answer here today. And or we can increase the damping in the system by changing this coefficient by inserting uh, vibration suppression pads under the tripod. So these are the things we want to talk about, but basically if you look at this equation, it's just four different quantities and each one of these is a force. We have an inertial force that's proportional to acceleration, a damping force that extracts energy from a vibrating system that's proportional to velocity, and an elastic force that's proportional to displacement. And of course, as I said, we have the uh, wind gust on the right-hand side. In the ideal world, if we had a pure damper, it would only provide resisting force if there is some velocity. We have to put these pads underneath the tripod, so it's got to provide some resistance to the weight of the mass that's sitting on top of the tripod, going through the leg, into the uh, damping pad, down finally to the ground. So it's got to have some stiffness characteristic as well. But here's the thing. When you put a soft spring, this is, a real, this is rubber, it's much softer than stainless steel. If you put this damping pad underneath each leg, you find that the now the total stiffness of the leg is not just the stiffness of the leg as it was with the steel, it's this formula here, which is kind of a complicated looking formula, but you can rearrange this formula into this form and it becomes a little more clear of what we're seeing. The stiffness of the leg, the total leg, the leg plus the damper, is now the stiffness of the damper, which again, it's rubber, it's very soft compared to steel. The stiffness of the damper times this quantity. We'll take a close look at the, what's inside here. We have one plus something and it's the stiffness of the damper, something small, divided by the stiffness of the steel leg, something large. So this number here, this ratio of the dampers, of the stiffness of the damper and the stiffness of the leg, is a number like 0 0.01 or 0 0.02. And so this whole thing in the parentheses here, parentheses, is 1.01 .01 or 1.02, which is just like, for all intents and purposes, just the stiffness of the damper. In other words, you could have the stiffest thing, you could have this thing be completely rigid, made out of the stiffest material possible, and if you put it on a soft spring, all you get for the stiffness is the stiffness of the soft spring. We would like to have a high value of stiffness, but if you put these in to get the high value of damping, which we also want, you're actually undermining the stiffness of the system when you do that, and there are some consequences for that. 
So it's a bit of a trade-off, and we need to look at that. But the damping pads will dampen out the motion, but it's killing the stiffness of the system. Let's go look at a solution to this equation here, where x is the, say, the tilt of the telescope in response to a wind gust. And we'll look at this tilt that we get out of this equation with and without these vibration suppression pads being in the uh, in the loop here. So here's a graph of pointing error. That's the x in the previous equation. I've got it expressed in terms of arc seconds, and we're looking at a function of time here. So one to two from zero to two seconds. And the blue curve we have is a is a tripod just sitting on a steel leg tripod sitting directly on a concrete surface, for example. So stiff on stiff. And in the orange curve is the stainless same tripod, but now we've put those damping pads in between it and the concrete surface. So we've got two responses here. The same wind gust happens. And what we'll see, well, let's look at the, uh, the steel uh, tripod only first, so the blue curve. The gust happens, and the tripod leans over. The mount leans over, tilts forward or back, whichever way the wind was blowing. And it gets up to some excursion, some arc seconds of, of, of excursion, and then it comes back, it goes back the other way, back the other way, and it just oscillates back and forth until finally it dampens out, say, in two seconds. All right, so this is kind of the response we would expect without the damping pads installed, which is why, what makes us think, gee, I wish I would, I would like to have those damping pads so we could dampen out that motion sooner. Well, if you, could, if you do that, you will get a quicker die-out of the response. However, because you've undercut the stiffness of the system, when the wind gust happens, the telescope leans over much farther. And then when it comes back, yes, it does die out much quicker. But we have to live with this higher excursion. So with a stiff system, no damping pads, we have a lower initial error, but that error persists for a longer period of time. When we put in damping pads, we get a higher initial error because we have also undercut the stiffness of the system. But because we have increased the damping coefficient, we, that damping or that, dis, that excursion, that initial error, dies out very quickly. Let's keep in mind that we're talking about pointing error, and that should relate back to arc seconds, and that should relate back to what is the resolution of the imaging system we're using. So for example, if I have a C14, with a camera that has a 3.8 micron pixel size, I've got an imaging scale of about 0.2 arc seconds. This width here represents the width of a pixel. Now look at this in comparison to some of these oscillations we have. A lot of these oscillations are occurring with the light never leaving that pixel, which is our entire objective. So these oscillations out here, anything between here is we don't care because it's within the error or within the size of one pixel. The light is going to the same pixel all the time it doesn't leave. It's only when you get out to here that you start seeing the excursions and go, something going out of bounds of that pixel. Now, of course, with a larger wind gust, just magnify these curves by whatever, okay, to be a larger excursion for both. If I had an ED-127, that's about a 900 millimeter focal length, same camera. Now you can see that the image scale has gone up quite a bit. And now I don't even, if we had this wind gust and the steel legs, I wouldn't even know it happened because it's all within one pixel. I would be aware that something happened, or might be aware something happened if I had damping pads installed because I've got that initial overshoot and therefore will get some effect of light leaking out of that one pixel. And then if I used an ED-102 with a 700 millimeter focal length, now I don't care, at least for this scale of disturbance, about anything really. Uh, this a uh, little bit of, a, of exceedance here on the with the damping pads it probably wouldn't even be noticed. We we wouldn't care about the the vibration at all, whether it's damped out or not. What we're seeing is that if we have a short focal length system, don't even worry about vibration. You're not going to see it because the imaging scale is so large. You can have significant disturbances, and the light stays in the one pixel because that pixel covers so much area of the sky. On the other hand, if you are imaging with a C14, you have to think about these things and. Uh, we need to take a closer look at uh, some of the trade-offs between a stiff system versus a highly damp system. And that's where we want to go. But keep in mind, everything that we care about is angular motion only matters if it exceeds uh, the pixel scale of your imaging rig. And that's why we want to take a look at these high uh, focal length systems.
Where do we put the tripod? A lot of us are, in fact, backyard astronomers, and we most of us care more or less about the quality of the lawn that we have in the back. This lawn that I'm showing here is much better than mine. Some of us have to take the tripod out, set it up, do imaging, and bring the tripod back in, and we'd like to not have the back lawn disturbed by having a bunch of pavers out there where uh, we put the tripod. You do want uh, to put the tripod on something stiff like this, that's good, doesn't have to be this large. What you don't want to do is just toss this down on top of the grass, particularly not as thick of a lawn as this is, because then the grass, even though it's compressed a bit under the weight of the telescope and the paver, it still acts as a spring. And so think back to that formula. When you have a soft spring in series with a stiff leg tripod, you are getting only the effect of the soft spring. What you might want to do, if you can get away with it in your household, is to remove the grass first and expose the bare ground and then put down a uh, smaller size hard surface for you to place the uh, tripod on if you can't just put it on concrete. I went to the hardware store and bought 12 inch long, three quarter inch diameter threaded rod and I have a couple of nuts on the end and that end nut is just hanging off so it's about half on half off leaving a a ridge around the edge and a recessed area and then I pound these into the ground where each leg of the tripod is and the tip of the tripod leg sits inside this recessed area so this is pounded down far enough onto the ground that it doesn't affect the lawnmower. You can't see it. What this does, it gives you a very repeatable location for your tripod. It is a very stable, very stiff uh, support for the tripod. And as I say, it's not visible, so it wouldn't stand out to you if you're standing in the back looking around. But I would suggest that you keep in mind that formula we looked at a little bit ago, where if you combine the stiff legs of a tripod with a soft support underneath it, all you're getting is the effect of the soft support. All right, so think about the stiffness of the ground where you place your tripod in order to minimize its sensitivity to wind gusts and, and people walking about. Okay, so let's just summarize what we've seen here. There's a lot of talk you'll see in, uh, in advertisements for uh, mounts, for example, what the weight limit is uh, for a given system. The weight limit that we refer to in astrophotography really relates to the guiding responsiveness, which in turn ties back into how much torque does the motor provide in being able to move around a heavy or lightweight imaging system. So this is, when we talk about weight limit in terms of an imaging system, we're not talking about the structural limit of the tripod. We're talking more about guiding performance, which has to do more with the motor performance. In analyzing just the standard Celestron tripod, for example, I found that from a structural perspective, it's like more than 200 times stronger than it has to be. So we are not concerned at all about the tripod's strength or stability for a normal uh, astrophotography setup. We do want a stiff tripod uh, because we want to minimize angular disturbances, for example, that might be caused by gusts of wind. So we do want that. It is a value. What is also a value is to dampen out any vibration that's caused by the wind. And some companies like Celestron offer these vibration suppression pads that you can place under each leg to dampen out the vibration uh, more quickly. And they do do that. However, uh, there is a problem with that. The vibration suppression pads have a killer effect on the sift stiffness of the system. When that gust of wind happens, it creates a larger disturbance than you would have had otherwise. Now, it dies out more quickly, but that larger disturbance, depending on your imaging system, the imaging scale of your system, that may be worse than a longer lasting lower amplitude motion uh, with no pads because that long, relatively long rain down period may be occurring, most of which is probably occurring, within the, the size of a single pixel, what a single pixel can see. So it, it will not register as an error or as pointing error because the light's just moving around within one pixel. These vibration suppression pads are made of rubber or rubber-like material, and they're much softer, relatively speaking, than the stainless steel legs of the tripod. So the one thing you definitely do not want to do is if you have a standard tripod like I do, the worst thing I could do is go out and buy an upgraded tripod and then also buy the vibration suppression pads and put them under it because then all I've got is the stiffness of the vibration suppression pads. I've lost all the benefit, stiffness benefit, of the legs of the tripod, of an upgraded tripod. So think about that. 
uh, before you make a move in this direction. Now, from my perspective, in my opinion, I would say that the vibration suppression pads are frankly doing more harm than good uh, for astrophotography. I do think they're probably of benefit if you're involved in community outreach, you're at star parties, you're doing visual work, and are standing and moving around the telescope or others are walking past as you're looking through the telescope, I think you you probably will get a benefit of the vibration suppression pads then because the brain will register a disturbance and even before you've had time to really process it, the damping pads have dampened it out. But for those of us who are astrophotographers only, I don't think these vibration suppression pads are offering much benefit. Okay, guys, well, that's about it for today. I just wanted to chime in on a topic we seldom talk about. And who knows, this will probably be the last time I talk about this topic. So clear skies, and I'll talk to you later.